welcome to the first ever Teens Conference. Come on, stand up, let's get hype. This has been something that's been talked about for so long, something that's been dreamed about since like the 90s, the 95s, before I was born. Um, but before we go in, I want to read a quick verse, something to encourage us all. Hebrews 10, 19, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened up a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences has been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. That is good news. Every single one of us was born into this world. We know that Adam and Eve, there was sin that has been, and that entered this world and now we walk naturally unclean. And it is so easy to kind of step in a place like this that seems super serious and we're going to go worship this super holy and heavenly God and it feels like we're so little. But there's a person named Jesus who came and now has made us clean. There's a blood that now allows us as we believe, as we trust in Jesus, this blood sanctifies us and allows us to worship him. And I want to just set a, even a, a standard and an atmosphere for the first service of the conference that we don't have to wait till tomorrow night or we don't have to wait till the end of service, but we can just boldly enter in because of the blood that has sprinkled, the blood that has made us clean. And we're going to just pray a very sincere prayer and just believe that we are clean, believe, and we're going to step fully into this presence, this holy God, His presence that is going to be here tonight. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your blood. Holy Spirit, would you come and lead us to the Father tonight? Holy Spirit, would you lead us to the Father's heart? Would you lead us into deeper on revelation of this God, of this presence? Lord, I thank you so much that you are no longer seem so far away, God, but because of your blood, Jesus, because of the blood that has cleansed us, we can now walk in sin free. We can now walk in just completely clean of all our guilty consciousness tonight lord we thank you so much lord and may your presence just come and may we experience it in a new way lord let us just just break off any lies of the enemy lord any lies of just what we did this week but lord we just put that away lord and just holy spirit renew us holy spirit lead us into the deep revelation of the blood tonight we thank you lord that there's a standard being set tonight that tonight, Lord, we'll receive freedom. That tonight, Lord, we'll say yes to you. That tonight, Jesus, we give it all to you. We'll see salvations. We'll see healings. Because tonight is the day of salvation. It is no longer tomorrow, tomorrow morning, but tonight, Lord. So we give you all the glory, God. We praise you, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Be glorified, Lord.
over every single person in this place, God. I thank you, Lord, that everything, Lord, bows at your knees, Jesus. Everything bows at its knees, Jesus. At your name, Lord. Lord, you reign, Lord, you hold victory, Jesus. Every addiction bows at its name, at your name, Jesus. Lord, that everything, Lord, bows at your name, Jesus. All suicidal thoughts bow at your name, Jesus. At your name, Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Break in the mighty name of Jesus. Everything, every word that 
face, Jesus. Because you're worthy of it all, Lord. You're worthy of it all, God, all our praise, all our worship, God. Everything that comes from our lips, God. That, God, you deserve it all. God, you deserve it all, Jesus. God, may we not forget. God, may we not forget the glorious splendor of your majesty, Lord. May we not forget how good you are to us. We thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, we fix our eyes on you. We fix our eyes on you.
God, you are worthy. God, you deserve all the glory in this place, God. God, only you are worthy. God, you won the victory for us, God. Only you are worthy in this place, God. And we give you thanks and we give you praise, God, in this place. God, we thank you so much for your word, God. We thank you, God, that your word is true. God, that in this place tonight, God, you're going to do something great and you're going to change lives, God. God, we believe this, God. God, we believe for you to move in this place, God. God, we stand on your word and we give you thanks one more time. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Please don't be quick to sit down. Take, actually take like three minutes. Go step out of your row. Go to the other side of the room. Grease somebody. There's lots of people here that you probably haven't seen before, so get to know someone new. Well, I have the privilege and the honor of sharing an offering message with you guys tonight. So get your money ready. Um, can we get a five-minute timer up there? And can you please put 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 on the screen? And if you have your Bibles with you, please open up there. Before we're going to read that, I want to... There's a lot of you guys in here that are, are younger and you probably... This is either heard about giving a lot or like you've never heard about it and you really might not know what it means. And so I just want to quickly share, quickly share a couple pointers of why we give. So here are six things. One, giving is seen as an act of worship and gratitude. Two, giving is seen as an act of obedience to God's commandments. Three, giving is a way to support God's work. work. And that includes things such as this construction project that we've done or um, our teens camps, our, our, like everything that we do, all our camps, all our everything, it's for God's work. Number four is for stewardship. Giving reflects our roles as stewards of God's resources. We are entrusted with earthly possessions and giving allows us to use it wisely and in ways that honor God. Number five, the Bible talks about people who give um, sacrificially and with a pure heart. There's eternal reward for them up in heaven. And number six, uh, we're about to go into the verse, but number six is the, pr the principle of the blessing that follows those who give. So let's go into 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. Well, I guess I'll read. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop but, crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your hearts how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others." I want to specifically highlight that verse number eight. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. And for me, this past year, I'll quickly share. Um, I've seen in my life how giving consistently, no matter the amount, but giving out of a place of generosity in my life, I've seen so many opportunities from God, whether it's from work, whether it's from places in church, whatever it may be, God has just been 
he's given me countless opportunities for me to serve and just to be a blessing to others. And so it says that God will generously provide all you need to, the, to those who give. And so, oh, and then it says, then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. And so I've been blessed so much that I can go and I can take the teens out every now and then and whenever we go to eat and pay for them. Um, it's not every time, but it's enough that I can pay for them. I can ride them, you know, some of them drop them off in Portland, some of them drop them off in Battleground, spend money on gas because gas isn't cheap. And so I have the ability with that blessing. And let's look at verse 7 one more time. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. So I encourage each of you as the ushers are getting prepared to pass the buckets, if you got two cents on you or if you got you know, $200, give whatever you decide in your heart and don't, don't do it out of pressure because this is an offering message, but do it because it's out of the generosity of your heart and God will bless you because the principle of blessing follows those who give. You don't give for the blessing, but the blessing follows those who give. And so do that. And then I'll finish off with verse number 10 in 2 Corinthians 9. It says, For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resource and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. It is God who provides. And I pray that all of you will learn that in your older years as you begin to give. That is God who provides everything and it is not you. So, yeah. Uh, with that being said, can we all rise God, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you, God, for your word, God. I thank you, God, that you have given us everything, God. And God, that when we give back, God, you, it is your joy to bless us, God, as sons and daughters, God. You give to us everything we need and we don't lack anywhere, God. God, I thank you, God, for the next speaker. I thank you, God, for, the, for your word. God, I pray, God, would every seed that is sown tonight be, would you see it and would you bless it, God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Would you please... Take your attention, put on the screen, we have a short video. And God set me free from suicidal thoughts, anxiety, and fear of man. Um, about a year ago, in March, my father took his own life. And throughout all of that, I would always blame myself. I would always say it was my fault. I'd always say that if I did a better job, like, it wouldn't have happened, but it, I was wrong. I would always just think those thoughts because that's what just the enemy would put on my mind to distract me. And through all of those times, I would always think about and remind myself that the battle was not in my hands. Jesus already won. Jesus already took all these things I'm dealing with and he put it on the cross. And a verse I would always think about is 2 Corinthians 10.4, which is saying that the weapons we fire with are not weapons of this earth, but they have divine power to demolish all strongholds. And uh, I would just think about this and I will think that I can't deal with this alone. It has to be with His help. It has to be with the Bible. It has to be with prayer. And that's how I truly overcame it with His help. During all of that, I was still going to teens almost every week and one specific night at teens God touched me so hard and he showed me his true love I understood what a true father's love was I understood that I am a son I am free and he has took everything that I will ever deal with and he set me free and took that away from me I just want to encourage all of you guys if you don't have a strong foundation and a strong relationship with God I truly encourage you guys to have that and build that because without God, you will really not go too far and he will make you happier and he'll bring hope and joy into your life. And I just really want to encourage that over all of you guys if you don't already have that. Come on, come on, our testimonies have power. Can I get an amen? Thank you, Max, that was a really good testimony. I hope everyone was encouraged by that. Okay. Um, real fast, let's all get up and let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. I thank you, God, for your blood. I thank you for the cross, and I thank you for your goodness. Father, I pray as I speak, Lord, may you speak through me. It would not be my words, but it would be yours, God. And I just thank you that everyone would have a seed that would be planted in their hearts, and it would grow and produce fruit, God. And we thank you, and we glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. How are y'all guys doing? That's good. All right, let's get straight to the word. Um, Numbers 21. Numbers 21, 4 to be exact. It says, Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and and against Moses, why have you brought us out of, up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soil loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on the pole and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole and so it was if a serpent had bitten anyone when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. So the Israelites, they were walking through the wilderness and they they were walking and they started getting discouraged. So they started complaining as the Israelites do, always complaining, always nagging. There's always something wrong. So like, Lord, why have you brought us out here just to kill us? Do you want us to die here? Pretty much complaining. So the Lord, because he saw that they're like sinning pretty much and the Lord sent snakes, venomous snakes and bit them. And so they asked, they said like, Lord, we have sinned. So can you, can you please help? Or he so told Moses, Moses, can you please ask the Lord to pretty much help us because we're dying and there's, there, everyone's dying around us. And so Moses pleaded with the Lord and the Lord said that anyone that looks at the snake, he will live. So anyone that just had to look at this snake, that person will survive. Let's go to Luke 131 through, yeah, Luke 131. It says, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. So now this is way later, like may I, a thousand years later, we're introduced to this new character. His name is Jesus. So Gabriel comes down to Mary and says, hey, you're going to have a child. You're going to have Jesus. And she's like, how I can? I'm a virgin. She's like, no, the Holy Spirit's going to come over you and you're going to conceive a child. So the Lord gave this name. And can we look into this name, Jesus? What does this name, Jesus, mean? If we look at the Greek word, there's a, there's a Greek word and there's a Hebrew word. It's in Greek. This is why we call him Jesus and not Yeshua because G, the, the Bible was written, like originally wrote, ri, written in Greek. So we have this name Jesus. And if you translate this to Hebrew, it means Yeshua. And Yeshua means he saves. So now we pretty much, we pretty much have this man. So like I give this, I give this example of the Israelites in the desert. Now there's this man that came down and he's pretty much, he's pretty much the son of God and the Holy Spirit is gonna, um, came over her and conceived Mary and now there's, this, there's gonna be a son born. His name's Jesus and his name means he saves. Let's go to Numbers 24, 17 through 19. Sorry, there's gonna be quite a bit of scripture. I'm not sorry, but like, this is good. Um, Numbers 24, 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Tumult. And Edom shall be in possession. Seir also, his enemies shall be a possession. While Israel does val valiant 
valiantly, okay, never mind. Out of Jacob, Jacob one shall have dominion and destroy the remains of the city. Wait, I'm reading the wrong scripture. Wait, I am, I'm reading the wrong, sorry. Yeah, so pretty much the now in Numbers, it's talking about this man that's coming and he's gonna, pretty much this chosen one, he's gonna come. If I'm being honest with you, I don't know if they fully intertwine, but I read the scripture and I thought it was really powerful. Like there's going to be this guy, like he's prophesying over this man that's going to come and he's going to save them from like all these cities and he's going to have dominion over them and all this kind of stuff. And when you look at it, it's like, okay, now the Israelites are like, there's some kind of danger going on. They're in some kind of danger and they need saving. There needs to be saving. So Jesus came. Jesus came and he lived the perfect life. And so during this time of when Jesus was born, there were the Romans. Romans were like, um, Rome was like over Jerusalem, like in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's like six different like big empires that went through and Rome was the last one. And Rome pretty much was like over Jerusalem and Jerusalem's like, hey, we're gonna have this Messiah come and he's gonna come and he's gonna come on like a, a chariot and whatever and he's gonna like take over, take over all of this and he's gonna save us from Rome. He's gonna save us from the Romans. But when you look at it, Jesus didn't come down to save the Israelites from the Romans. Jesus had a different purpose, a bigger picture that the Israelites did not see because they were so in their moment that they were so scared that they didn't actually see what was ahead of them and how like they were living in sin and how there was something that they needed to be saving from and it was not the Romans because even if they got saved from the Romans, they're still destined for hell. They're still gonna go to hell because it's like, they can't save themselves like, even though Jesus, the Messiah would come and he would free them from the Romans, but that wouldn't really do anything. That, they would just live a hundred years or whatever and then they would just die and yeah. And let's turn to 1 John 2.1. First John 2, 1. It says, if we say then that we have not sinned, wait, sorry. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for our, ours only, but also for the whole world. So now, Christ lived this perfect life. And now the Israelites think that the Messiah is coming and he's going to save them from Rome. But no, that's not what actually happened. He had a bigger picture in mind. So he's like, I'm going to come. I'm a, the Lord, the Lord, I mean, the father was like, I'm going to send out my son because my children are not in a relationship with me. I'm going to, I'm going to send my son to die for, um, to die for these people, uh, for my, for the Israelites and be the atonement for their sins. And because if you don't know, like, you need atonement, like, for their sins. If you even sin once, you need to sacrifice a lamb and all that stuff. I'm not getting into that. That's not my point. But Christ, like, this is kind of my main point, that Christ died for you on the cross. And listen, Christ died, and he didn't die without a purpose. He didn't die just to die. Christ died for your sins. And what does this mean? Now we can come into relationship with the Father. Now we can spend time with the Father and be in union with him, not because of us. Like, me and you Without God, we're like, without the blood, we're destined for hell. Like, you sinning once, you're going to hell. Like, there is no, there's no sugarcoating it. There's nothing else to say. But listen, God loves you so much. Oh, come on. Let's go to John, um, John 3, 14. They're talking with, um... The main Pharisee, I forgot his name, um, Nicodemus, there you go. They were just talking about Nicodemus and talking about the born again stuff. And then Jesus was saying here, and this is going to tie back to what I was saying. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, the, so must the son of man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And here, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So now, 
Anyone who believes in God will be saved. Where are the scriptures going up, by the way? Can we, can we get the Jonathan sing back up, please? I'll wait for that. Um, but anyone, everyone pretty much, there it is. Um, by this we know. John 3.16, not 1 John 3.16. Anyways, um, so the people of Israel, they had to look up to a serpent. Like a bronze serpent had to be made for them to actually be saved. But here's the thing, like, like Jesus gave this example with a bronze serpent and he tied it back to himself and saying the son of man, he, he's almost... He's not talking about parables. He's talking about himself. Like he's saying like the same way the serpent, like the Israelites had to look up to the serpent. Now you have to look up to me. I mean the son of God for you to be saved. Now all we have to do is believe in God and we'll actually be saved. And listen, this is through love. This is through grace. This is through everything that God has done for us. Listen, I would not, I would not be on the stage if it wasn't for God's blood, uh, Jesus's blood. You guys would not be in this crowd if it was not for Jesus's blood. Jesus paid it our, for our debt and he has finally restored that relationship and now, now we can come into communion with him. Now we can spend time in his presence, not, not like be afraid of death, but actually be with him. And as I was saying, it all only takes faith. If you're not like, like we're talking about belief, this conference is belief. Like what are you believing for? What do you think God's gonna do? Believe, believe, believe. Listen, it says, all you have to do to inherit eternal life, all you have to do is believe. All you have to do is believe. It's literally that simple. Just believe that God has died for you. Believe that he rose again and you will be saved. And pretty much, God has defeated death and we don't have to live in our sin anymore. We don't have to be stuck in our sin. Listen, if you are in your sin, if you are stuck in these things, listen, there is freedom in Christ's blood. Do not forget that God did not die for no reason just for you to have eternal life but still be stuck in your sin. No, you're not stuck in your sin anymore. Now because of Christ's blood, you are set free, you are made new, you are a new creation. And just remember that. Remember what Jesus has done for you. And this is just the thing to remember. God, God has saved us and has given us eternal life and he has saved us from death. And for you to, just one thing you will take out of my whole message, I don't care anything else, you just hear me rambling, it doesn't matter. Like the one thing I wanted to take out is all you have to do is believe and you will be saved. That's all you have to do. And just remember that that Christ's blood, you don't have to work for it anymore. Christ's blood has made you new. Christ's blood has saved you. So, yeah, so let's pray real fast. Can we get to our feet? Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, and we look back to the cross and we thank you. It was by the cross that we are made new. It was by the cross that you have forgiven us. Your blood has atoned for all our sins. And Father, we just thank you and we stand in remembrance of the cross. We stand in remembrance of the blood and we glorify your name, Jesus. In your mighty name we pray, amen. Come on, can we welcome up Philip? Let's stand back up. Before I, before I share, we actually have um, a pretty serious need that we want to pray for together as a church, as a body. Um, it's for the Mizuk family. Um, Anna Mizuk's dad um, has been in a coma for a week. He had a stroke. And he's just in a really, really bad spot right now with his health, um, a bunch of different things. I don't even know all of it, but it's bleeding in his brain, just a lot of, lot of really bad stuff going on. And I think Anna's actually here tonight. We want to pray for Anna. We want to pray for her family. Um, the doctors say that not, not much can be done um, and that if he doesn't wake up soon, they might just let him go. But, 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 but. We believe in Jesus. We believe in Jesus that we don't care what the world shows us physically. We see with our spiritual eyes. We don't care what we see or what we feel or what's going on around us. We live by faith. So um, if we could have Anna come up and let's just have a bunch of girls surround her.
ladies come out. Let's pray for her. God, we thank you so much, Lord. We thank you so much for this family, and we thank you so much for Roman, Lord. We thank you so much, God, for your hand over their life in Jesus' mighty name. God, we thank you so much for your power. We thank you so much, God, that the spirit that raised Christ from the dead now lives in us, God, and we pray over his body. We pray that his body would be made well in Jesus' mighty name, that every sickness, that everything wrong with his blood vessels, everything wrong with his brain, everything in his body that is not functioning properly, we command you to come Come under the blood of Jesus right now. Lord, we pray that you would comfort their family. Give them hope. Give them faith. That their faith would not decrease, but only increase in Jesus' name. We pray for healing over his body in Jesus' name. Brain be restored. Body be made well by the blood of Jesus. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, we lift him up to you, crying out, saying that this is our only hope. That you are our only hope. You have not failed us, God, and we believe in your name. We believe in the power, in the name of Jesus, and we declare the name of Jesus over Roman. We declare the name of Jesus over their family, in Jesus' mighty name. God, we believe, we believe, we come in agreement. We believe in Jesus' name. We believe in Jesus' name. No weapon formed against their family will prosper. No sickness against their family will prosper. No plan of the devil will be able to prosper in Jesus' name. God, but your name is victory, and your name is all power. Lord, we pray for them, Jesus. We need you, God. They need you. God, you are only hope. You are only hope. We cry out to the blood of Jesus, God. You are only hope. You, would you comfort them? Would you give them faith? Would you let them believe? Let them believe. No doubt, no lie, no, no thing of the enemy would be able to get into their mind. But they would be rooted in faith. They would be rooted in hope. Knowing that your hand is over their family. In Jesus' name, I thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for him and his family. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You are our only hope, God. You are our only hope, but we believe in you. Comfort them. Be there with them. We thank you, Jesus. We have faith and we believe. Would you be with them? Would you comfort them? Would their faith only grow? Would every lie of the devil be Broken by truth in Jesus' name. Be with them, God. We ask you to intervene. You are our only hope. Our hope is in you. We bless him, God, and we bless this family. Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer real quick. God, we thank you so much for this time that you've given us together. Holy Spirit, we need you in this place. Our, our biggest desire, our number one desire, God, is to encounter you tonight. God, I pray that encounters would happen today, God, that we would remember for the rest of our lives. That we would grow up and we'd be 20, 30, 40, but we would remember the teens conference in 2023 that God came and you marked us. God, and we're not here to just put on a conference or just to act professional or any of that. But God, we are here because we genuinely need a, need a touch from you. We genuinely need more of you. Everybody in this room, we need more of you so much, God. We need you desperately, Lord. And I pray that through this message that you would, that you would encounter us, that you would strengthen us, God, that you would increase our faith, increase in us knowing what you've done for us. 
In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Come on, who's happy to be here? I'm so excited that we have a teens conference this year. We didn't have a teens service, but we have a teens conference. That's even better. Um, I don't know about you guys, but we, God will come according to our expectancy. God will come according to our hunger. Those who thirst will be filled. So I want to ask you guys, today, tomorrow, just don't like, you can't like just do it. But expect God to move. Expect God to move in this room. Expect God to move in your friends and you and anybody. If you need an encounter from God, expect that this weekend. Something that you've been dealing with or you've just been feeling low, you've just been feeling all this stuff, expect God to move this weekend. Amen? Okay. um, uh, Growing up as a teenager... I um I think I genuinely always knew in the back of my head that God was the right thing to do and following God was the right place to go but I didn't have the right understanding of what that looked like. I didn't have the right understanding of who God was. I didn't have the right understanding like there was just a lot of things that I, had, I thought I had to accomplish or a lot of things that I had to do before I came to God, before he would accept me, before I could actually start living for him. Like I literally thought that I would just continue to sin and sin and sin forever and ever, and I would never actually be good enough to have a relationship with God, and that's a lie. See, before we know Christ, like before we know Christ, we have this understanding, this made-up understanding of who he is, but when we read the word and we get to know him actually, our, we realize that our understanding that we had of him completely shifts and we get to see him for who he really is and that's when the freedom, that's when the breakthrough, that's when everything happens. So you guys are so lucky as teenagers to know the Lord, to be serving the Lord, to be running after him and I encourage you guys, these are the best years of your life to serve God and to run after him. Don't wait till you're older, do it now. You'll be blessed. And um, growing up, I almost, I knew I needed to be with God, but I had no clue what God did for me. I had no clue what it actually meant. All I knew was you have to serve God. All I knew was you have to serve God, and I didn't understand why. I didn't understand what he did for me that would make me want to serve him. I didn't understand any of it. All I knew was that in the back of my mind, I would ask my mom, Mom, can I please go play Xbox? She'd be like, go read your Bible instead. And I'm like, why do I have to read my Bible? Like, what is the point of all this? And today I just want to, I don't want to be super long, but I want to give a representation very, very simply. It might not blow you out of your seat, but that's okay. But I have it on my heart to give you this representation of what Jesus truly, truly did for us to to help us walk in a new identity, to help us walk in a new creation, to help us walk in the new, not in the old. Like Christ did not come to just fix your life a little bit and make it better, better and happier, but he came to completely give you a new life. And that new life can start today. Like, I remember sitting in the back of church and you're just, man, like, I don't know why I'm here. I don't want, like, you're in sin. You don't want anything to do with God. But if you knew who he actually was, all those things would change. And I want to encourage you, don't waste your time. Don't waste your teenage years just sitting in the back or in the front or in the middle, wherever. (laughs) But trying to be cool, trying to just fit in, hanging out with the wrong group, wrong crowd, it's not worth it. You might think sin is exciting, but life with God is more exciting than anything you will ever experience. A life with God is, it'll teach you so much. It's not just all these religious things, but every single aspect of my life, I see God, and it's so exciting to see him move. And so, um, without further ado, can I get Eli Akimenko and Eli Spinoza? Double Eli's. Okay, wait. Grab, there's two white shirts under Kayla's chair. There isn't? There is. I see them. (laughs) 
You guys want to get up here? Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Both put on a shirt. Give me the marker. The Milwaukee marker. <clears throat> okay, Eli, you can put on a shirt. Uh, Eli, this Eli, you can put on a shirt and go over there. Just a few steps that way. Okay. So this is, I'm going to go by their last names so you guys don't get them confused. This is Espinoza, our boy. Come on, give it up for Espinoza, our boy. <laughs> Eli is like, actually, let's, let's give Eli a different character. What should Eli's name be? Yeah. Pharrell? All right, this is Pharrell. This is my boy Pharrell. Pharrell enjoys playing soccer on the weekends. Um, he works at FedEx. Um, what's your favorite food, Pharrell? Sushi. Okay, sushi. <laughs> okay, so Pharrell, let's go back to the very beginning of Pharrell's life. Pharrell was just born, okay? Now he's a baby. And Pharrell grows up and he hears about God in church. His parents are Christian because they're Slavic. And Pharrell grows up in church. <laughs> the only, one of the only non-Slavic people here. <laughs> Pharrell grows up in church and he always hears about God. He always hears about how he should serve God and follow God. But Pharrell never really understands why. And as he gets older, um, Pharrell, when he's three years old, breaks something, and his mom asks him who does it, and he blames it on his sister. And Pharrell has committed a little bit of a sin, and this is a stain that's on him. This is now part of him completely. This is like Pharrell, you know what I'm saying? Okay, now Pharrell, whatever, it's like a little bit, it's not that noticeable, he grows up a little bit more, and now he's like seven, eight years old, and he steals a bike from his school. And so, Pharrell makes another mistake, that's stealing. And the Bible says that every single person has fallen short of God's glorious standard, and we pretty much, I'm giving us all of representation that we are Pharrell. We have made mistakes when we were three, five, seven, whatever. Pharrell gets a little bit older. Pharrell turns 12. And at school, Pharrell's friend introduces him to pornography. He goes home. He watches it. He does what he shouldn't do. He looks at what he shouldn't look at. And now he's kind of stuck. He continues watching it, continues watching it, continues watching it. More, more, more. And then he grows up and he's like, man, I, I feel like such a terrible person. I don't, now he's like 15. He's like, I don't, I'm so messed up. There's nothing that I can do. There's not, there, he can't change himself. So he tries, there's this void inside of him that he can't fill. So he starts, he starts drinking. He starts doing drugs, starts hanging out with the wrong crowd. And all of a sudden, his life is filled he was an innocent little boy that his parents told him to go to church, but now his life is filled with sin. And this is part of who he is. This is on him. This is, this is his identity. This is who he is now. And so Pharrell is stuck, and he's, he's just stuck in this repetitive sin that keeps on happening and keeps on happening, and he keeps on sinning, and he keeps on sinning, and he keeps on sinning, and he keeps on sinning. And there, nothing will ever fill this void inside of him. And then Pharrell gets invited to a conference. <laughs> Pharrell gets invited to a conference, and the preacher makes an altar call. And when Pharrell comes to the front and responds to the conference, he meets Jesus. Come to the front, meet Jesus. Okay, we don't need to make this weird. Eli, I mean, Pharrell, 
encounters the Lord, repents of his sin, goes, God, I, I have this emptiness inside of me. I truly need you so much. Let's walk over here. I feel like they can't see us. Can you guys see us? Sorry. He encounters God. And in this moment, exactly what happens is Jesus takes this away from him. And he gives him this one. You're going to put that one on too. You guys are going to switch shirts. And so in this moment, Pharrell gets saved. His life is transformed. His life is new. And the Bible says that Jesus took away the sin. He paid the debt. He all that stuff. And now this stuff is all on Jesus' body. Now we understand that Jesus later takes this off and nails this to the cross. So actually, take this off. We're going to put on a cross. This is the cross. Sorry. Stay with me. And he puts all this, all the sin, all his shame, all his guilt, and he puts it on the cross. And he gives him a new identity. And now this new identity, this new shirt that he puts on, the Bible says this is now who he is. He, can we agree that this is a new creation? This is not a life that just got a little bit better. This is something completely new. That has passed away. It's still on the cross, and this is completely new. There is a new life that Christ gives you. It's not just trying to come to service and being a little bit better, but he gives you a completely new identity. He gives you a completely new life. And so now Pharrell is excited, and he's happy, and he's so excited at this conference. And now he's going, and he's walking, and he's just living his life day by day. And then he hangs out with good friends. He tries to hang out with better friends. But one day he decides to hang out with bad friends again. And so now, he hangs out with those bad friends again, and they turn on a bad song, and, and let's say he's talking to them, and he says a cuss word again. And so now Pharrell, but see, he doesn't receive any more marks, because the sin that Jesus paid for was past sin, present sin, and future sin. So he committed a mistake. But like Ethan read in 1 John, we have a mediator that mediates on our behalf. So now that sin is still in the grave. See, but a lot of us are still thinking that now we have to restart. And now there's another mark on us. But no, Christ has made us forgiven. Christ has made us righteous. And Christ has made us a new creation. When you sin, your, your, your sin, your mistakes, they are not yours anymore. Christ has paid for them. He has nailed your sin to the cross. The new covenant, it's not over and over and over again. The old covenant is, it's soon disappearing, the Hebrew says. And now every single sin that you commit continues to be on the cross. You have a new identity. You have a new purpose. See, now he gets to walk with Christ. And see, these black marks is what separated him from God. Is what separated him from the Holy Spirit. Is what separated him from the presence of God. And now this, this t-shirt is completely gone. So now he can enter the presence of God boldly, not by his works, but because of the blood of Jesus. And in Colossians it says that Jesus, nailing our shame and our sin and everything that we did, he nailed it to the cross, openly shaming the devil. See, the devil, even if he tries to make Pharrell sin over and over and over again, it will always be in the grave and he will never have hold over him ever again because he believed like Ethan said all you have to do is believe when you when the is when the when the Israelites looked on the cross as Ethan, as, as Ethan talked about all they had to do was believe that they could be saved and God would save them you guys can sit down Eli thank you Does that make sense? Let's, let's open up to
Sorry, one sec. Let's open up to Romans chapter 4. If we can get it on the screen in NLT. Raise your hand if you're there. Okay, let's just start reading. Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But that was not God's way. For the scripture tells us, Abraham believed God and counted him as righteous because of his faith. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. God also spoke of this when he described the happiness, oh, David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who declared righteous without working for it. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight, Yes, what joy for those who record the, whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. And then we're going to go a little bit lower. And read verse 16. So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift and we are all certain to receive it. Whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. If we have faith like Abraham's, for Abraham is the father of all who believe this is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in, in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken. Even though about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead. And so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered, wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, he grew stronger. And, the, and in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God, encount, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous... It wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him. The one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was handed over to die because of our sins. And he was raised to life to make us right with God. Amen. And I just want to, if you're here, for the first time, even if this entire thing is just for one person, if you're here, you don't need to try to fix yourself before you come to God. One guy used this example. He's like, you don't get clean before you hop into the shower. You don't have to try to fix your life and fix yourself and make sure you're doing everything right before you come to God. No, when you come to God, he gives you a new identity. And the Bible says... That when we read the word and when we look at the word of God, this identity, we actually begin to see who we truly are. See, you can think that you're the person with the lines on yourself. And then there's also a person that stands righteously. And if you, and if you let this world influence you, if you let whatever influence you, you will always see yourself as the person with the lines, with the sins, with the mistakes. But when you look into the word of God, that says it's like a mirror. And you begin to look at yourself. It says, if you just look at it, but you don't do what it says, you're just looking at it and you're just, 
You're getting little glimpses of yourself, but you're forgetting who you truly are. See, yes, Christ died because you have so much, because we all sinned, because we all made mistakes that we can't even count. But Christ also died because you were called from the very, very beginning to live with a white shirt on. That's the way that he created us. And when we look at Abraham's life, when we look at Abraham's life, he, um, God gave him a promise. God gave him a word to stand on. And though everything in his life was trying to tell him one thing, that the promise will not come to pass. It says, over a hundred years past, Sarah's body was as good as dead. Although everything in his life was shouting at him that God's word was not true. He chose to believe and to stand on the word of God. And that's why he's the father of faith. Guys, the faith is the evidence of the thing we cannot see. So when the world shows Abraham one thing, but he chooses to make a deliberate decision to not focus on this, but to believe in something that he cannot see, that decision is actually his faith. Does that make sense? And so in your life, Paul says, I do not trust human judgment anymore. I don't, I don't think what, I don't, I don't let people judge me. I don't even judge myself. Because God has, man, how do I, God, God made us a new creation. God made us holy. God made us acceptable. God made us above reproach. God, God finished everything for us. And a lot of the times we can always feel like we still have something left to do. We, we can feel like we have something that we need to add to the cross. Something, yes, Jesus did everything, but now I need to just... No, when it comes to your holiness, when it comes to your righteousness, when it comes to your relationship with God, when it comes to you stepping into the presence of God, it is 100% everything that he's done for you. And you go into the presence of God trusting him. David says in Psalms 27, I want to be in the presence of the Lord always, delighting in his perfections. He delights in his perfections. We come into the presence of God and we look at our perfections. But when you come into the presence of God, like today, I came into, the, I, I came into service and I did not feel, I didn't feel God, whatever. But I, I chose, I'm like, okay, I have to make a decision right now to raise my hands, not because I had a good or a bad week or because I feel worthy or unworthy, but I choose to raise my hands because Christ has done everything for me to stand in the presence of God. And Christ has done everything for me to be able to worship him and to be able to praise him. Like, I might not feel like I have a white shirt on, but I have a white shirt on because that's what happened when I came to the front three years ago. I have a white shirt on. And if you accepted Christ, you have a white shirt on. Whether you believe it or not. I said this at conference, but the battle is not over dominion or power. It's fighting over what you're going to believe in. Are you going to believe that you are righteous? Are you going to believe that your sin was taken from you? Are you going to believe that your sin is laying in a grave nailed to a cross? Or are you going to believe that you still have it and it's still yours? Because by one disobedient act, we all became like this. But by one righteous act, one obedience, we all get to put on a white shirt. We all get to be righteous. We all get to be blameless when we stand in the presence of God. And guys, the emphasis that I want to make is that you will never find fulfillment in life until you understand. You will never... You'll always feel like you're not doing enough. You'll always feel like you're such a bad Christian and you're so two-faced and you're such a big hypocrite. If you don't let God transform the way that you think and show you that you have a white shirt on. Let God show you that the, the shirt with all the markers, with all the stains on it, with all that garbage, he took it away from you. And now this new covenant, it's every past sin, every present sin, and every future sin. And now like, 
That's why we sing, like, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. He's worthy of it all. Like, that's why we worship him so much, because we couldn't do it ourselves, but he took our sin, and Colossians says he nailed it to a cross forever. Now sin no longer has power over us. Now we are more than conquerors. And it's so easy, because I did it, to become a Christian and to live a Christian life, but to still feel like your shirt is still so messed up. That's a lie. You might be standing here going like, I don't know, that sounds good what he's talking about, but that's not for me. No, if you accepted Christ, your shirt, what you did last week, all the mistakes you've been making is no longer on your shirt. And you have to believe that. You, and when you, like, that's your new identity. And your new identity is only hidden in the word of God. Your new identity is only found. And when you begin to read this and it begins to tell you who you are. Let's all stand. Right now I want to, if you maybe got invited by your friend or you've never been to our church or you don't have a right relationship with God, it's not worth it living that kind of life. And there's going to be something inside of you that's going to pull at you and tell you that you can't, you can't go to God, you can't, you can't, you can't, but you can. That's a lie and I want to encourage you tonight. I want to encourage you tonight, if you are not right with God, if you never even had the initial moment of encountering him, if you never even had the initial moment of him switching shirts with you, if you genuinely do still have that garbage, that baggage, that weight on your shoulders, that those thoughts, those, those urges, those lusts, all those things, God can meet you tonight and you can have that, the gift, the free gift, the exchange of him looking at you as blameless, of him looking at you as holy, as perfect. Can I get somebody on on keys? Thank you. And so, right now I want to take a moment to pray. Um, Let's all just begin to pray. And from a genuine heart, begin to thank God that we are no longer that shirt We are no longer everything that we once did. We are no longer our past. We are no longer identified by who we are, but we have been given something new in Christ. We have been given a new creation. We have been given a new body. We have been, everything about us is now new. And so God, I thank you so much that, God, I thank you so much that even when I was a sinner, God, and I thought that I could never even come to you, that you changed my life, God that you changed my life forever, God. God, I had so much sin on me that I couldn't get off of me. I had so much things in my life that I was dealing with. I had so much struggles. I had such a messed up identity of who I was, God. Everything in my life was going wrong, but when I met you, you took away the old and you gave me the new. Lord, my, I died with you on the cross and you gave me a new life. And God, we thank you that you did it all for us that it is not by our works, it is not by anything that we could have done, but it is by everything that you did. It was by your sacrifice, it was by your blood, it was by everything that you did for us that we can stand here today. God, I pray that if there's people in this room, God, that are still living in their sin, that are still living in their their filth, that are still living a flesh life, God, I pray that today you would meet them. You would meet them and you would take away their sin and you would give them righteousness. You would give them holiness, God. You would speak life over them, God, that you would that the, the old would pass away today and that the new would come to life, that today is their day of salvation. Lord, we are in genuine need of you. 
God, I thank you that it was not by any human effort that we could have done any of this, but it is only by your grace. It is only because you loved us. It is only because you took our place on the cross. It is only because you took our place on the cross. If you're here and you still have your old shirt on, if you're here and you still feel like everything that in your past, everything, all those things, your thoughts, if you feel like that's still who you are and you just are asking God, are just asking God to change your life, are asking God to help you become new, if you've never even met Jesus before, if you've never even given your life to him and you never had that exchange with him, I wanna give this opportunity to you to come to the front and meet him. And this is not for a person, this is not for a church or a ministry, but this is your personal life that you're dealing with. I know what it's like to be in sin. I know what it's like to be messed up. I know what it's like to just never feel secure, to always feel like a mess. And I'm telling you, you can come to Christ. There's nothing that is holding you. Nothing will separate you from his love. He wants to give you life. He wants to make you new. He wants, to, he wants you to be happy. He doesn't want you to be depressed. He doesn't want you to be suicidal and have all that things that you're dealing with. But he genuinely wants to give you a new life. And if there's no one in here, that's fine. But if you need that encounter with God, if you need to be changed, if you need to give him your old sin, your mistakes, your entire past, everything that you've ever done, and you just cry and go, God, I need your righteousness. I need something new. I need a new life. I want you to come to the front and meet him. Holy Spirit, we need you tonight. We are in desperate need for you, God. We don't want to just stand here and sing songs. We don't want to just stand here and, Lord, we want the real thing. God, I want the real thing. I want to encounter you. Lord, we really, really want to encounter you tonight in a way that we have never before. God, I want to leave changed. God, we want to leave change tonight. Holy Spirit, if there's anybody in here that needs you tonight, I pray that you would minister to them directly. We truly need your presence. We truly need you, God. In this time that we live in, we don't know what will come tomorrow. We are in need of you, Jesus. We are in need of you more in every single area of our life. God, we need you. Would you be in this place? In Jesus' name. Amen.
dead and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who made my dead and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who made my dead and raised this life up. We want to do something very special tonight. We want to open up the altar. We can do this. If we can just have every eye closed right here. And if you heard the message tonight and you felt in your heart that the Holy Spirit was speaking to you or you felt an unction in your heart and you felt that like, God, this is the night where I want to accept you as my Lord and Savior. And if you felt that and you're with your eyes closed, would you just raise your hand? So Jesus, I want to accept you as my Lord and Savior. Would you raise your hand? You can raise them high. This is what we want to do. With every hand that was raised, I know this might be a little scary, but this is one of the greatest moments of your life. When Jesus... When Jesus, when Paul was writing the book of Romans, he didn't say you committed a sin, that this sin was the amount of your death. No, he said you passed over from death to life. And we want to celebrate for it with you and pray for you. So if you raise your hand, would you be bold tonight? And would you, in front of Jesus, in front of God, would you make your way to the front? We want to celebrate with you. So every person that raised your hand but in front of Jesus, not looking to the person to the left or to the right, but would you make your way to the front? We want to have people pray for you. Come on, would you give it up for them as they wake their way down? Every person 
that raised her hand. Thank you, Lord. If you want to make your way all the way to the front, all the way to the front. We are, I want you guys to look at me for a second. We are so happy. We are so happy that you made this decision. It might not seem like it, but right now there is a shift in the spiritual atmosphere where hell has no idea what just happened, but angels are rejoicing. Angels are rejoicing because what looks like, it just, you come to the front, there's actually a new life. The word says that there is a new life in you, that the old man has gone. That old t-shirt has gone, the new life that is in Jesus Christ is now in you. And so we are so happy, we are so happy that you're here. And as we continue to worship, if there is any area of prayer in your life, if there is any area that you need, you say, God, maybe I've been saved before, but God, I want to give you my life. I want to give you my life again. There are areas of my life that I'm struggling with Jesus. I want to give that to you. I want you to take control of my life once again. If that's you, as we continue in worship and as the leaders meant to pray for people here, would you make your way to the front and surrender every part of your life to Him that He can be in control of it once again. Come on, God, I thank you so much. Lord, I thank you so much for every person that came out of here. God, I thank you so much for every person, Lord God. God, that is here, God, that, that made a decision to give their life to you. Lord, it is your Holy Spirit that draws them. It is your Holy Spirit that comes upon them and changes your life. Jesus, I pray as every person that came up here, God, would they experience the power of the Holy Spirit? Would they experience this new life? We pray, God, that everything that's upon them, Lord God, everything that they were sown in the past, that they would forget the past and that they would see this new life in Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you so much. Lord, God, that you died and that you rose again. And that when you died, we died with you. And when you rose, we rose with you, Lord God. Lord, I pray that every person here, God, God, that they'll no longer look at their old man, but they'll look at this new man that they have in Jesus Christ. And that from this day forward, that every day would be within Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, to you be all the glory in Jesus' name.
the sacrifice that was made, we are standing here. That if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be able to be with you. If it wasn't for you, there would have been no way, Jesus. But I thank you, God, that because of you, because of your blood, we are standing here forgiven, God. I thank you that because of your blood, we have everlasting life. That we don't have to burn in hell for eternity. But I thank you, Jesus, that now we have life in you, Jesus. And I pray, God, that we stand upon that, God. I pray, God, that we realize, Jesus, that there is life. Oh God, it is still open, Jesus, for you are waiting with open arms, God. I pray, God, that there are sons and daughters returning back to the Father. He is waiting for you with open arms. He wants you. He wants you to come back to him. He wants you to find him. He is waiting for you at the altar call. Let's begin to go into thanksgiving right now for every person that came up. As heaven is rejoicing, let us join heaven. Lord, we thank you so much that your spirit is still moving to this day. Some from 2,000 years ago, Lord, to this day, your spirit continues to move, Lord. We lift you up, God. We praise you. We thank you, Lord. Let us live in remembrance of what you have done within our lives. Let us live in remembrance and thanksgiving of what you continue to do, God. We thank you so much. God be all the glory. To God be all the glory. Lord, we lift you up. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Come on, give him a shout of praise. Thank you, Jesus. 